Thank you. You can be seated if you like, or you can keep standing. Your call. <laughs> Your call. Hey, we're done. All right. <laughs>
How's everybody doing? How was your Christmas? It's kind of weird though, wasn't it a little different? I, I think my height of my Christmas was our Christmas Eve service. 
and I isolated myself. I had invites to go with family and friends locally, and I just said, no, I'm staying home. <laughs> I'm around people that I don't want to get sick, you know, so I just was very careful. But it was kind of restful and relaxing also at the same time. So we have a video that kind of sums up 2020. Let's let that fly, and I'll pick it up right after that. sums it up, doesn't it? I don't know about you. I've had a god-awful year. I have. Um, physically, I'm way off my game. Uh, pressures of just trying to keep everything floating and then releasing that to God. Friends of mine, close friends of mine, more than one that are going through some horrendous medical uh, diagnoses. It's just been a crazy year. But everything here is true, so I'm thankful for within all of it that we can rely on the promises of God, and God is with us all the way. And looking for the good things that God was doing throughout the year, too. I want to start today with talking about the Magi, and uh, that'll wrap up our Christmas uh, Advent season type thing. But they gave three different gifts as they worshiped the baby Jesus. And just to rerun the story for you, Jesus was born of a virgin, as you just saw on the slide. And they were wise men. They were very wealthy. They were educated Gentiles. They were not Jewish. They traveled a very long way to worship Jesus. You might think there were three of them because you saw the nativity scene back there or your grandmothers or there's that song, Three Wise, We Three Kings, We Three Kings. I don't think so. I, uh, it says they were wise men. They were carrying a lot of wealth. Three guys traveling a long distance like that carrying wealth. There'd be a lot of robbers and people that would get that. I think there might have been dozens of them. We, I, we don't know for sure, but they gave them some unusual gifts. And we find in Matthew chapter 2, I want to show you what the text says. When the wise men saw the star, they were filled with joy. They entered the house. They saw the child with his mother Mary. And what did they do? Let's say it together. What did they do? The wise men bowed down. And then what did they do? And they worshiped him. So the Magi bowed down, they worshiped him, and then the scripture says they opened their treasure chests or whatever how it was, and they gave him some unusual gifts. They gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now there's some spiritual significance tied to all the gifts. The frankincense is, is sort of a healing essential oil today, but it showed and represented Jesus as high priest, that he would represent his people to God, that he would be the one to give his life, and then he would sit at the right hand of the Father in 
in power, that's the seat of power, praying and interceding for us in prayer. The myrrh was uh, representing Jesus as the suffering servant or the Lamb of God. But I want to focus on the gift of gold because throughout history, the scarcity of gold and the value of gold made it a gift fit for a king. And I want to talk about Jesus as king today. So before we do that, remember a couple of weeks ago I said you have to have fun and you have to laugh and it's an essential part of life. So we're going to play a little game today. We're going to play Name That King. It's not going to be any fun without you, so please participate. When you see the images, just shout it out. Now, if you think of Simba, what do you think of? Lion King. Boom. How about a big gorilla? King Kong. King Kong. Pat. Pat, you get a flashlight. Give that to Pat, please. <laughs> Let's do another one. What do you think of when you think of a whopper? Yeah, it used to be right behind us. Okay, we're doing good. How about scary novels and scary movies? You guys are awesome. I don't have enough flashlights. When you think of interviews. Yeah, Larry King. Who said that first? All right. <laughs> Let's uh, go to sports. When you think of basketball, somebody younger. LeBron King James. LeBron King James. Sticking with sports, one for the boomers. Me too. Uh, tennis. Billy Jean. Jean King. Yay. Let's go to music. Boy, the musicians will have fun with this. When you think of the blues, really smooth guitarist. BB. We got a place in New York after him. How about you think of soft jazz, old school? Woo. <laughs> Pat, you're going to get all the flashlights. <laughs> Let's switch over to rap. <laughs> um, he just put out an album. What did it say? Who am I talking about? Kanye. Jesus is king, right? That's what I want to talk about today is the kingship of Jesus as the fact that they gave him gold. So for us, Jesus is a king like no other. He wasn't just born of this earth as a person coming in, but he is the king of king and lord of lords. And that's what I want to talk about. Now, Paul mentored young Timothy. Matter of fact, they're called the pastoral epistles. And Paul said this to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6. For at just the right time, meaning the perfect time in the universe, it was just pregnant with boom and time to come, Christ will be revealed from heaven by the blessed and almighty God, the King of kings and Lord of lords. I think it was done twice because he was revealed as the baby and people saw that, and then he was revealed when he started his ministry also. But in the Greek language, when Paul said that, you couldn't say it any stronger than what he did and put more emphasis on it. He is saying Jesus has supreme authority. He's not like any other king. He's king of all king, lord of all lords, every nation on the planet, and king of the cosmos. It's all in his hands. That's what he's saying. And God had a pretty unusual way, an unexpected way to show his love in the world. The problem is the Jewish people expected him to come in really high end. He would be born in a royal palace. There'd be purple linens and all luxury and the whole bit. But they certainly didn't expect the Savior and the Messiah to be born in a cow stable next to unclean people and unclean animals. There's no way. I mean, even Nathaniel said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? You know, they wouldn't expect him to be born the son of a carpenter. That's just didn't work with their, their theology. And they certainly wouldn't expect this king to befriend prostitutes and touch lepers and, and then choose, choose the people to gather to him, the ones that all the religious institutions kicked out, all the people on the fringe. They, they would never expect the king to choose uneducated fishermen and despised, hated tax collectors to follow him and become his disciples. It's almost like I'm going to, if he was here today, I'm going to grab the hell's angels and the pagans. And you guys got to stop fighting. It's all over. Now you come follow me and I'm going to teach you. And you're going to be my disciples. And I'm going to completely transform your life. And you're going to transform everybody else's life. Wow. You know, I mean, they never expected that a king would forgive a woman caught in the act of adultery. And by the way, where was the guy? Because in the law, it said both should be stoned. 
but he would continue to confront the hypocrisy of the Pharisees again and again and again and again. He even overturned tables. You know, we have that picture of Mary, the artwork in the Renaissance period. You have the little Smurf baby Jesus, and you got this giant picture of Mary holding the baby Jesus. We wouldn't expect him to overturn temples, overturn tables in the temple because people were using his place of prayer for personal profit. You know, and they never expected the king of the Jews would ride in on a donkey, even though it said it in the scriptures. They were so used to the scriptures. They wanted him on a white war horse to come in as a complete king, take over, knock the Romans out right away. And, and the ones they would never expect the people cheering for his arrival would be the outcasts and, and the overlooked and, yeah, even the immoral ones. You know, no one, expected, no one expected a king to stand trial for crimes that he didn't commit. Nobody expected an innocent king to be whipped and beaten and scourged and, and stripped naked to hang on an instrument of torture. It said in the Old Testament, cursed is anyone who hangs on a tree. So this, they just couldn't accept any of this. And then dying a death that was really reserved for the worst of the worst criminals. No one would imagine the king who was the creator in the flesh to be hanging as the creation. Ugh mocked him and spit on him and tortured him and and all the while everything that they're doing to him he looks up to heaven and he prays father have mercy on them for torturing me they don't know what they're doing they have no idea please forgive them they don't know what they're doing they have no idea and when they offered him a drink to dull the pain he rejected it he, facing the entire weight of all the sin of the entire world upon him he who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness in him. The great exchange took place on the cross. And then he said, Father, I finished the work you gave me to do. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Nobody ever expected a king to die the shameful death with people mocking him that he did. And then no one expected that when he said, Teletestai, it is finished, that the earth would shake and God would turn out the lights midday, and then the curtain would rip from top to bottom, giving people access into the Holy of Holies. Because before that, if you went in there, you were D-E-A-D -E dead. Nobody expected this. And nobody expected that they would bury him in a borrowed grave. Nobody expected three days later when some women went to check on the tomb that the stone would be rolled away, the body's not there, the king was risen from the dead, and now sitting at the right hand of the Father, interceding in prayer for us. That's the king I want to talk about today because it's an incredible, unusual way for God to show his love in a broken and a sinful world. You know, and what's interesting, if you look at the first century when this happened, the story, there are three distinct responses to Jesus as king. And this was, now we're talking 2,000 plus years later, that spirit's still here. You know, I'm, if you have the courage to be honest with yourself and not so much everyone here, but I'm sure you all have friends, but you'll see different responses. Maybe it was you at one time. But I want to start. The first one, if you know, is represented by King Herod because Herod opposed Jesus as king. And he wanted to guard his kingship. He wanted to guard, he was crazy. If you were related to Herod, it wouldn't be good for you because he killed everybody in his family, afraid that they were going to take his throne. He had all the babies, as you know, all the babies in Bethlehem under two years old slaughtered. My God, you know, because he was afraid of someone taking his throne. He wanted to be king. And I don't know who you know that this would fall into, but I'm sure you know people that say, I don't need that God stuff. I don't need that in my life. That's good for you. I'm glad you do that, you know. Uh, I'm going to do life my way, and that's, that's the bottom line. I don't want some outdated book written over 2,000 years ago to tell me how to run my life. And I don't need some church telling me what to do either. I am God of my life. You know, I, and you all know someone like that. And you know what? To me, that's an unwise approach to life because what I usually say to people when they come in and they want to talk, I'll say, well, just how is what you've been doing working for you all these years? You have no problems anymore? Everything's fine? You know, and I just kind of put it that way. Um, the next one, the second group, really common today, common among the Jewish priests, they didn't oppose him. They just dismissed him. You know, and... They dismissed him as king, even though their scriptures in Micah 5.2, it prophesied that a ruler would come from Bethlehem. 
They only lived five miles away. They didn't go and check it out. Again, that's what made the wise men wise. They would not worship him as king. And I think you have, you know, you ask some of your friends to come to church. What do they say? You know, dude, it's Sunday, man. I got, you know, I work on Saturday. I only got one day. Ah, oh, come on, come on. It's good for you. It's, it's a good thing. No, it's, like I said, it's good for you, not so good for me. Well, how about reading the word of God, man? It's biblical instructions before leaving earth. How cool is that? Uh, you know, that's really not for me. I don't understand it. Besides, men wrote that. I, I don't believe all that stuff, you know. Well, how about would you love to share? You're on a, there's a mission about sharing God's love in the world and finding out who you really are and who you were created to be and then pumping, plugging into that mission because everybody's walking around looking for something to plug into. And it's almost like all of a sudden the round peg goes in the round hole, the square peg goes in the square hole, and you're just connected to the ultimate reality doing what you were, all those imperfections that you have, they're there on purpose. And God makes him, and we're these, these jars of clay, and, and the glory of God shines through those imperfections, and it just makes you exactly who you are, and then you realize, wow, this is who I am in Christ. And that just blows my mind, completely blows my mind. But they just dismiss that. They just miss Jesus as king. You know, and then there was the wise men, and they bowed down and they worshiped Jesus, the ultimate act of reverence. You know, it's... It's not about me. It's not about my desires. And they were educated. They were wealthy. And they had some clout, you know. But, but they traveled a long way. With everything in me, I bow down and I worship you. The way we might say it today is, I surrender my life to you. You know, it's, again, you're the ultimate reality. You're the creator. I'm the creation. You have dreams and hopes for me, plans to give me hope in the future. You have a certain plan for my life. I want to know what it is. So I'm going to surrender my life, and I'm going to have to pray and ask you to keep that surrender because I know I'm not able to keep it. I'll do my best, but I'm going to, I'm going to need you to do that for me. You know, So I'm just curious if anybody, like what your response would be among all the three that I just mentioned. Or if not you, you certainly have friends that you can relate to. And, you know, it's like, yeah, well, you know what? They just dismiss him. Yeah, I did that church thing and, you know, the whole bit, but not for me. You know, so is he king of your life? Is he king of your heart right now? Um, when I was a kid, you know, I grew up in, I started in Hoboken. I went to Catholic school and Catholic church. The nuns there were pretty intense. You know, they beat the tar out of you. Um, the thing with the Catholic church is there's one all over the place. So when you move, there's another Catholic church. So we moved to a different town. My father had to get us out of Hoboken. He was afraid of my cousins having a bad influence on me. Um, he had, and they all thought we had money because we moved out of Hoboken. Now you need money to get in. But the priest that we went to, he was a prison chaplain. So he came out of the prisons. And he was just God awful. I'm sorry. And there's not one person I know that knew this man that doesn't say the same thing. But mom would take me to church every day when I was a little guy. And I, I, really remember that. I don't even know what age it was, but I remember. And the altar boys had an effect on me. I became an altar boy. And again, the priest just scared the daylights out of me. And he would terrorize everybody, especially at Christmas time, you know, because then he'd start with the CEO Christians, Christmas and Easter only Christians, and he'd lambast them. And then he'd say, well, there are people that are just passing through. I love preaching to people that are just passing through. You know, I've done funerals in biker bars. I, I've spoke a lot outside of here i love that because to me the word of god is like time bombs and you're being you're giving a gift to people that are there and it's up to the holy spirit one man plants another man waters god gives the increase so anytime i get a chance to plant or water i'm blessed you know so uh, again there were a lot of times i just at one point i dismissed the whole thing because i couldn't take it anymore i couldn't take all the guilt that he was putting on people i couldn't take the accusations any of it and and <laughs> There was, to me, it was all religion and rules, and, and, and as soon as you, like, it almost seemed like God was just waiting for you to step over the line so he could smoke you and smite you, you know? And I was like, what? And it, but something kept pulling me back over the years. And I remember one time when I was just in tears on my bed because I knew I was falling out, had a new girlfriend, you know, the whole bit was going on, the rock and roll drums. I was like, I just can't do this anymore. I was crying my eyes out. And I said, God, please someday bring me back. And praise God, I'm standing in front of you today. Um, 
But it wasn't the Christmas story that so much got me, the little baby Jesus and all that. What got me was you have him leaving the throne room of heaven and stripping himself of everything and being born in, in the cow stable as a baby and, and becoming for people that were rejected and despised. In our language today, it would be for people who just can't seem to get it right. You know, whether you might be a mess financially, and a lot of people are right now, or you might be on your second, third, fourth marriage, whatever, you know, and you're in that bad place again. And it's just, um, you're longing for something more, and you're hurting inside. You let substances start to control you, you know, and you try to find meaning in all the wrong places, and it just gets to be one thing keeps piling up on another. But he came for people like that. People like that is me, to be honest with you. So I'm glad that he came. That's what kind of hold of me. And he loved me right where I was. He forgave me of everything I did. Not because I'm good, but because he's incredibly good. And I keep spilling my milk, but I keep wiping it up and I keep going. You know, I always, I notice something in me that misses the mark and steps over the line. And I notice a twisted thing that runs right down the middle of me. If you're honest with you, you'll see it too, you know. But again, I never thought... Christmas is a tough service to preach. Even if people are passing through, I love it. You know, so again, I, I pray there's something in us that grabs something I'm saying today because with everything in me, I just really want you to have a relationship. Since I've been here, I've been preaching on relationship versus religion. Since and over 10 years, I've been doing that. And, and so talking about our king, he's not the angry God, like I said, waiting for you to mess up. He's not the man upstairs. He's not the big guy in the sky. He's not your homeboy. And, and he's not the, really, I mean, people say that to me all the time. Oh, I, you know, big, I'm going to talk to the big man, you know, dude. <laughs> he's not the baby anymore either. He's certainly not that baby anymore. He's the righteous king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. You know, and, and who is this king that gave up his life for us? And he's the king of glory. He's the king of righteousness. He's the king of ages, the king of all kings. And what does he do? He's the king that heals the sick. He opens blind eyes. He heals deaf ears. He strengthens the weak. He frees the captives. He restores those who are broken and hurting. And he is the king. That's who does that. He's a shelter in your time of trouble, an ever-present help in time of trouble. He's the light of the world when your world is dark. He's the prince of peace. He is the lamb of God, the alpha and the omega, everything in between. He's a resurrection and a life. His goodness is indescribable. His power is incomprehensible, and his grace is irresistible. That's who he is. At his name, darkness trembles, presence, demons flee. Demons flee. They want no part of him. The devil hated him, and he couldn't stop him. He defeated death. The grave couldn't hold him. Jesus is that king. That's who I want you to know. You know, and I don't know, perhaps in some moment or some way that you saw yourself in one of those and something breaks through, and you know you don't want to oppose him. And I certainly don't want to dismiss them, you know. So, so maybe, just maybe, you know, I want to encourage you to open up your heart today. There's a reason it's a smaller group today, and I kind of like that too. I was never about the numbers. But there's a reason that we're all knit together, and this message is coming at this particular time. And if you feel that tug on your heart, it's really important to just let him in there. We're going to do, the musicians could get in place. We are going to do another worship song. I encourage you. Satan cannot inhabit your praise. Just get into it. You can sing the words. Even if you've got a bad voice, God gave it to you. Let him hear it. You know, so just sing it out loud. You know, you need him. You know, you need his forgiveness. And you know what? You want his presence. And I promise you, he's here because two or more are gathered that he is there. And there's good news. We call that the gospel. And that's, you know, in a quick explanation, God loved us so much, he sent his son born of a virgin. Why is that important? Because he didn't inherit the sinful nature of an earthly father, but had the nature of the Godhead in heaven infused in him. And he was fully God and fully man at the same time. Wow. You know? And again, I don't have to understand how that works to benefit from it. I said most of that the other day. So therefore, he could be our innocent sacrifice because he lived a perfect life. And he shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. And the good news is that when he gave his life, this is really good news. He didn't stay dead. <laughs> That's unusual, right? God raised him from the dead so that anyone, and that includes you, anyone. Anyone means anyone. So stop with all the churches judging people and stop with all the keeping people out. Anyone who calls upon the name of the Lord 
He will hear their prayer. And if you ask him to forgive you, even if you don't know you did anything wrong, we're just not born, you know, this is a holy God. We need something in the middle, and that's why Jesus did what he did. But he forgives your sins and makes you brand new. I'm not saying he gives you a different personality or he turns you into something inherently that you're not. But now there's a new spirit working there. And now there's love being infused, a godly love being infused in your heart. Not a love to go judging people and pointing fingers at them and getting mad and screaming and ripping people apart with scriptures. Using them as a, as a machete and leaving them on a table without sewing them back up together. Come on. You know, most people that go do that to people are operating outside of the spirit. I'm going to say a prayer. I'm going to ask you to follow me in this prayer. I'd like you to repeat it out loud if that's okay with you guys. You know, and it's really, if you don't want to do that, just at the end say, me too, Lord, because God honors that. But right now, you're the direction, not so much that you're not the sum total of your past. You're the direction that your feet and your heart are pointed in right now. And point them towards God, not me, okay? So, nobody prays alone today. Pray, Heavenly Father, forgive my sins. Jesus, save me. Be Lord of my life. Be my king. Fill me with your spirit so I can follow you. And worship you and show your love. Because you will change me. My life is not my own. I give it to you. Thank you for your new life. Can we give yourselves a hand and celebrate today? Amen. Let's stand together.
Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home. What joy shall fill my heart? Then I shall bow. I'll see you again till next Sunday. And um, usually we do something, but you know what? This year, New Year's, New Year's Eve, New Year's, I'm going to leave it alone. Um, we'll meet again next Sunday. And uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you, be gracious to you, and grant you peace in your life. Be careful out there. Be safe. Hope for the vaccine soon. <laughs> I mean, I just, uh, I want to get on the fast track. I'm, not, I'm usually an anti-vac guy, but not this time. I want to get on the fast track to be able to take this and get this over with. So God bless you. Thank you all for coming today. Oh, we have a, there's a giving station in the back again, too. We don't pass it around, but thank you, those that have been contributing. Uh, not that we count by how much money we bring in, but the ministry is being supported, and we thank you so much.